Election fever is sweeping the country. As Hawaii voters prepare to cast their ballots later this year, could taxpayers one day fund future candidates' campaigns? Right now, voters have the option to give, but lawmakers want to expand the program, potentially using millions of state funds to help fund campaigns, whether you vote or not. Public financing for elections, the pros and cons. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. It's no secret money plays a big part in political campaigns, commercials, ads, and even those yard signs all come at a cost, a cost that discourages many people from running at all. But what if campaigns were financed by tax dollars? Despite falling short this year, there's a growing push for publicly financed elections. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbsy.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook and YouTube pages. Now to our guest. Kristen Izumi Nitao is the executive director of the State Campaign Spending Commission. The commission works to make sure campaign donations and expenditures are legal and transparent. Chad Blair is with Honolulu Civil Beat. As a reporter and editor, his work has focused on how political decisions impact people and communities. He also has a PhD in American <laughs> Studies from UH Manoa. And Cameron Hurt is the program director at Common Cause Hawaii, a nonpartisan organization that aims to curb the excess influence of money in politics and promote fair and honest elections. Political analyst Colin Moore comes to us from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he has been a longtime political science professor, now working in the Matsunaga Institute for Peace. I was interested to hear that, Colin. That's very interesting. Thank Let's you. start off with sort of a broad brush look at, you know, this move for public financing is because people are unhappy with the system. Um, Cameron Hurt, uh, welcome to the show, and give Thank us a sense of me. what's so wrong with it that it needs to be fixed in this dramatic a fashion. Um, I think if we could just go back first to the Citizens United ruling that the Supreme Court passed, which basically allowed for corporations to have the same buy-in as regular people. That really kind of changed. It's, well, it was already going on, but it solidified the change in our election process where corporations were able to compete with regular people for political influence. Now, I don't know about the regular poet person, but I can't keep up with Meta. I can't keep up with the Steve Jobs, with the, with the Amazons of the world, or even with the local developers or the mainland developers here. Um, and what that has done is it's allowed for people with the biggest pockets to have the loudest voices in our voting system. Um, and so what we're seeking to do is change that by giving everybody buy-in power so all of our dollars matter. All of us need to be courted for that vote. But Chad Blair, um, as a longtime reporter here, do you feel that uh, money is too much of an influence? And how is it an influence? Are, are people literally being bought or is it more of a broader systemic problem? And not just corporations, uh, unions, labor unions as well because of the Citizens United decision. You know. I don't think a bank or an airline or a navigation company gives money to a politician because they necessarily support their views or they like them or they want them to be a senator or a congressman. I think they give them money because they want to be heard. They want someone to listen to them. And when that person calls and says, I need to talk to you about this bill or this appropriation, that person is going to pick up the phone and say, okay, compared to the average person or me or Cameron, we're average persons, yeah. people have a lot of money, <laughs> much less likely that they're going to pay attention to them at all. That's how you get your foot in the door, and that's why money in politics is such a big deal. You know, uh, Kristen, you should be in the from Campaign Spending Commission. Tell us, uh, we talked about Citizens United. What is Citizens United, and what did it do to change the system? Uh, Citizens United permits the formation of super PACs, and super PACs um, have the ability to raise unlimited funds. They are not subject to a contribution limit, and they can spend as much as they want to, um, as long as it is not coordinated with a candidate. Um, and that has pretty much cemented the core of um, our our politics here. And so currently we have uh, 19 super PACs, and I think everybody has seen how super PACs have um, supported candidates as well as opposed candidates. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be a hard thing uh, with special interests that can unite 
amongst by forming a super PAC and um, and and getting its um, priorities across by sorting. How, how long ago was Citizens United now? I mean, just roughly. Because I, I was looking at the, I was doing a little bit of research, which I don't usually. It seems do. like it's been here forever, but it's, it's more like 20, 10, 2011. 20, or yeah, yeah, 20, 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yeah, because there. I was looking at a, a newspaper article from 20, 2004, yeah. no, 2014, and it said public financing dies again at the legislature. That was 10 <laughs> years ago. Um, Colin Moore, what do you think the impacts uh, are on the system, and has it changed dramatically, or is this still business as usual? In what respect? It, the Citizens United. Oh, I mean, I, th I think it has changed dramatically. I mean, I think that these, these super PACs wield tremendous power, and they're, it's, they're very difficult to regulate. I mean, th there was a, another change that happened prior to this, which is that the Supreme Court said we couldn't have expenditure limits, and I think that sort of uh, motivated a lot of the concern about campaign finance, right? One of our only tools in the United States is contribution limits. Even those are sort of difficult to, to regulate. And so public financing was a way, um, you know, I think to try to cut this connection between donor giving and the actions of politicians. And Hawaii actually was a pioneer in this. I think people forget it. Our, our system hasn't been working very well recently, but it was part of the 1978 ConCon Con to create this mm -hmm partial public financing system that still exists. So, you know, we're talking about this again, but I think it's important for folks to remember, we were one of the leaders of this originally. Now, when you do um, a partial public financing, you can make deals with that candidate, essentially, that says, you're not gonna spend any more than this, right? That's the, that's, that's the quid pro. That's the trade-off of pretty much every system where you're accepting public funds, is that the government taxpayers are gonna provide you with some money to run your campaign, and in exchange, uh, you're going to agree to this expenditure limit. Um, you know, that's, and, and you know, the, the trouble with this, and I think we'll get this into this a little later in the program, of course, is that candidates can always opt out. We can't force people to partic participate in a public funding program. And so if you're a well-connected candidate, a rich individual, um, you can always raise more money privately. If I'm not mistaken, it was David Ige when he was a fairly relatively unknown state senator challenging a sitting governor. That's right, Neil Abercrombie, Abercrombie. Was outraised. 10 to 1 by a city, by the governor, and I believe Ige was on the partially public he financing. Was, yep. As soon as he won the primary, I believe he gave that up, did he, he not? Gave it right up. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask uh, Kristen um, Nital, is how popular is that? Do a lot of candidates sign up for this? The partial? The, yeah, this is we have. Um, so the partial public funding program has, won for, has been run for the last 23 years, um, and it it, it, you, the, we ha, we do have people who win with partial public funds. This past year, we did we wanted to boost its participation by um, offering two to one match. So it was it, had, it has not been really touched since when its inception. When you say inception. two to one match, what's the mechanism? Of oh, that? basically, um, if you raise so much, we will match double the match requirement. And um, but unfortunately, that bill did not make it through. This legislative oh, you did? session. Oh, it was a, it was a proposal. It, it was a bill. Something you could do administratively. No, no, right? But no, the the public funding program pretty much exists as it was, you know, from its creation, and we've been trying to boost it to increase participation, um, but it has met with a lot of troubles, particularly I think with the comprehensive public funding. It was sort of misconceived as competition. Um, but I think the campaign, the commission was, was uh, you know, understands that this is a constitutionally mandated program, and it's one for which there's money, and one for which we don't need additional personnel with, at, the, at the rate it's running. The one that we have. The one that we have. So okay. that's why we tried to boost it. I'd like to have Cameron pitch in. From your, your observation of Hawaii politics, where do you see the the money uh, being, having the most influence and the most concern for you? I don't think there's one area because corruption runs so deep. If I, just being completely honest, it is all very concerning. Um, when, um, when we think about even the partial funding that we have now, why didn't that bill move forward? Um, we just heard that it's been as it was when it was first um, written. It's been as it was. You do have some people who run using it, such as Ige or Representative Janae Capella, and they are able to win. But when you talk to them one off, they'll tell you that you don't get a lot of money from it. There's not s enough money to where it significantly matters. And I think 
if you're going to turn your back on fully funded campaign uh, financing, then not improving the system that we have seems like neglect. Let me let me throw this out if for Colin and Chad. You know, was it, you know, was it cost to run for the state house or the state senate or this or the governor? I mean, and is there a big difference there? Because I've seen relatively no relative nobodies who are willing to put the shoe leather in and walk a house district, for example, and and win. You know, depending on how people feel about the incumbent. I mean. Um, is there some level at which the money starts having a lot more influence? I think you need enough money to be competitive. I mean, sure, that you know, our legislative districts are small enough where that kind of person-to-person -person contact can still make a difference. But I actually crunched the numbers, and it turns out it's about forty thousand dollars in in the House. So the, the the thirteen House candidates who beat an incumbent, and I think that's probably the the the, the bar you wanna you wanna evaluate this at, because open seats can be be. A little more difficult to, to discuss, you know, they spent about forty thousand dollars, and so I would say that if you're not able to raise pretty close to forty thousand dollars to run for a house seat here, it doesn't mean it's not possible for you to win. But I'd say that's probably the threshold you need to reach to be competitive. And Chad, that's the smallest political districts that we have. <laughs> it's forty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. Right. I was looking at the numbers too because the campaign spending commission actually tracks them. You can go yes. back and look at it over time. I, I saw one. Person, House Speaker Scott Psyche, who has been in tight races uh, the last two cycles, who was again up against Kim Koko Iwamoto, barely won both times, like 130, 140 votes. And we'll see what happens this time. But uh, Speaker Psyche, I believe, spent well yeah. over $200,000 to keep that seat here on Oahu. And then when you go to the Senate, what's the average in the Senate? 80 to 100? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, about $1,000. Lorraine Inouye ran against uh, Laura Ocasio. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, and she spent something like one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Of course, Senate seats Senate are much seats are a little bigger. Yeah, they, they are much bigger, and you can't walk it. And remember this: you can't buy television ads for a House or a Senate or a Council seat. You, there's just no way. It's Let just not going to be profitable Kristen at all. I mean, tell, what are they spending this money on? I mean, uh, I mean, Scott Psyche's district is like from block A to block B. It's not <laughs> a very big space. A lot of know, condos. Yeah, it's a lot of condos. <laughs> but it depends it's on how much money your opponent is spending. I mean, so, yeah. No, but I mean, what are they spending the money on? I mean, that's one of the things you guys track. I mean, generally sure. speaking, when you spend two hundred thousand dollars in a house race, what are you spending it on? You're 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 buying um, flyers and you're doing banners and you're doing commercials, you're doing ads, you're doing social media. Mailings. It's mailings. Yes, you're doing all of that. Um, so the money, I have to admit, there's eight authorized uses for candidates, and mostly it's directly related to their campaign to win it. So that's a good indicator. But I, I, I do want to comment that if it's 40,000 is the, is the number to win a house race and something. 80 to 120, somewhere Let's in call there. it compete yeah. instead of yeah. win. Yeah, that's, yeah. compete. Uh, on a good note, that's where the full public funding bill came in. It was a crunch of numbers as to the average of mm -hmm. what it took to want for the winner mm -hmm. in those races. So it's real numbers. But yes, it's sort of skewed too because there will be races that go above that and there will be races that way below that. And that has to do with an incumbent. It has to do with um, the, the, the political makeup of the person, the opponent. The transit um, of the district, how transit the district ab is. Yes. Absolutely, Cameron. So there's a lot of unknown factors, but for purpose of this bill, at least the numbers, the maximum amounts that would have been um, be able to qualify for, were consistent with the data as to what it would take to win. By the way, spending on campaigns there's also bentos for the volunteers, oh. bottles of water, t-shirts, <laughs> yeah, like whole swag, up. cars. But to the bill itself, uh, <laughs> help me out. Is it SB 3281? Was that the number? It all kind of runs together after a while. But That's if I understand why. correctly, someone who got the requisite yeah, sure. signatures to run for governor could qualify for as much as, was it $2.5 million yes. in a mm -hmm. governor's race? Josh Green, uh, two years ago, spent $4.5 million. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's a prodigious fundraiser. He holds a lot of them. But that's what you need, a couple million dollars to be competitive in a statewide election for governor. Yep. Um, let me uh, throw out a, a good question from a, a viewer, uh, Nikos from Aliomanu. Um, how can a public financing system, and we're talking broadly now instead of, uh, you know, specific numbers in this one, we'll get to that later. How can a public financing system respond to PAC spending, like the millions spent opposing Jill Takuda and Sylvia Luke in 2022, or self-funded checkbook candidacies? Um, uh, Cameron from uh, Common Cause. I think what it think does. Do you think that, the, the, oh, that any public financing system will actually 
eliminate this kind of PAC spending? Absolutely. And I think that, one, you can look at other states, cities, and districts that have implemented um, campaign financing and how that helps. I think, again, what we have to realize is what we're talking about is a cultural shift, not an immediate shift, right? So if we introduce fully funded um, campaign elections, campaign financing, then we would be able to see over time the public would start to say, because, again, you're using our money. So if you're using my money, I want to see you take no money from these super PACs. And should I see you get campaign financing and take money from super PACs, I won't vote for you. It would, but technically, they're not taking the money from the super PACs. Super PACs just spending it, right? Oh, so spending it to um, combat them. Or, 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 or to support to them. Yeah, I mean, it's an outside group. Right? I think it's important, one, to have candidates of integrity and respect. So if you take it, signing a pledge that you would not support that. Um, and I think if you're battling against dollars um, being spent on you, against you by super PACs, that's where it's great that this bill has it to where you have already rallied up community support, okay? We're talking districts. So if you want to bring in money and you're, if you're an outsider to my community and I've already done the legwork to get my $5 contributions and get my names and start, then I'm already able to compete better than I would be before. Okay, I, I think that's Nikos. I wonder if it's the same Nikos that a lot of us at this table know. He brought up Sylvia Luke. Remember, it was a super PAC, B Change Now, uh, the, the Carpenters Union, mm -hmm. PRP, that spent a lot of money to defeat Sylvia Luke in the primary for lieutenant governor two years ago, and they supported Ikaika Anderson. Yes, they cannot coordinate, and Anderson you know, was kind of hands off because he could see he was getting a lot of help, but it backfired. For one thing, the ads were terrible. For another thing, <laughs> nobody seemed to buy that Sylvia Luke was this criminal enterprise that was being described, so it can backfire. The voters can see through this. Well, but let, me ask, let me ask Colin to jump in on that because, you know, that's Citizens United, right? I mean, you can't stop some, some independent group from participating in a campaign to whatever degree. That's right. Is it, does it work? Can you campaign against those groups and win? Because it seems like people flounder along around when those things come in big. Sure. I mean, you can campaign against them and win. I mean, Jill Takuda won, like we just mentioned, Sylvia Luke won. This public financing isn't a silver bullet, and it's not going to stop super PAC spending. I think we should be real, real clear on that. Super PACs are still, still going to be involved. But I agree with Cameron that it can begin this cultural shift. Um, I think it is a move in the right direction. I mean, the alternative to this is just to say, after Citizens United, there's nothing we can do. We throw up our hands and we go home and say, you know, the the American campaign finance system is just horribly corrupt and. And, and that's, that's all what there it is can't to say. Become. And, that's yeah, exactly and I think that's right. That's exactly what it cannot become. And, and that's why we can't sit idle on our hands and be like, well, this seems like, because, uh, you know, um, special shout out to Representative Tarnas, who called the bill fatally flawed. I would love to get his diagnosis of the current system. If the bill is fatally flawed, what is this system that has perpetuated corruption? unlike most states in the union that we've seen. I'd like to ask Tarnas why he didn't try and fix the bill and make yeah. it better so that it could pass. <laughs> Especially when it had meat in it at the beginning, when it was in the Senate, when it was voted unanimously through. I think the question that you that guys happen? are posing is, can our political class, the existing legislature, ever be trusted to change a system that basically entrenches them in office. That's the best yeah. question. That, all yeah. night. <laughs> that, that is the question. We've yeah. got to change the, I would say, the, um, the spirit of our politicians. Because can it happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't convince me that we don't have legislators who really want to do the work of the community. You can't convince me that we don't have people right now who would love to vie for a seat so they could really do the work of the community. So is it possible? Yes. But I often say this. In the late 1800s, merchants physically came into this island nation and took it, and they have not loosened their grip since. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to change the systemic culture of this. Okay, I want to. I think we can start walking into some of the details around how this would work because uh, I'm starting to get questions along those lines. Sherry, an email. What would you say to those asserting that clean elections are an open door to fringe candidates mm -hmm. and fraud? So. Uh, let me give this one to Kristen Izumi Nital from Campaign Spending Commission. How would this work? So you don't just giving you're not just giving money to anybody, um, and without strings attached. How would be the mechanism work that you're giving it to real candidates who will spend it on real elections? Um, well, the, the, and we're talking about the spirit of the full comprehensive public funding program. So the the bill really. Um, um, 
and Chad, to your point, the bill was a 2381, Senate Bill 2381. Thanks for the correction. Yeah, and um, essentially the, was, the way this program runs is that should the Campaign Spending Commission declare that they'll run the program because we have sufficient funds in this point, it, it, per the bill was 30 million, which we don't have, we only have 2 million in the trust fund. Um, then um, we Wait, would, so it would be 30 million to do this program. Well, the 30 million is a number that the it's commission computed for all for the 128 seats, assuming that you had two candidates running. Okay, but if you have more than two candidates running, this number increases incrementally. So it's an estimate because not everybody will opt in. Because I agree with Cameron, you know. Um, Colin, Chad, that this has to, it has to grow, the public funding program has to grow systemically. It has to be a strategy accepted by all for a cultural shift. I don't think we're there yet, um, but I can see its benefits of that. But I'm not sure we're there yet because look at the bill did not pass. But um, as far as operationally, um, a candidate, if they were running for governor, they have to get $6,255 contributions um, and this will have to be from individual people from individual people it's yes real people Hawaii yeah, voters right, yep. Hawaii voters yes from Hawaii, yes Hawaii yeah. voters and that has to be confirmed by their name their address their date of birth and a signature which we would have to verify or certify that that five dollar contribution right. is legitimate well, I'm one of those guys those people who You're want one to of give, those guys want you to get give, it and I, if, I can only give that person five dollars yes I can't give him more no Ooh. No, small dollar contributions of $5. Okay. So should this candidate get $6,250 to $5 contributions, they then, and have an opponent, and they qualify, go to the primary, the primary, um, the state will give them $1,675,000. And should they survive the primary, go to the general, they will get $825,000 for a total of $2.5 million. Now that, the threshold is very different for uh, exactly. for Each, county yes. races, Absolutely. for state house races, Absolutely. So far let me, fewer signatures. Well, that's Correct. that's the biggest nut right there. Right, but right. let me so I can contrast that with the lowest figure, and that's for the Big Island or the Hawaii County Council. They would only require fifty fifty five dollar contributions, and if they um, have an opponent in the primary, they will receive thirteen thousand four hundred dollars. And should they move on to the general with an opponent, they will get $6,600 for a total of $20,000 for the Hawaii County Council program. So there's a big variety, and this runs for every single seat, yeah. has a different computation. So let me, let me go, uh, so uh, Colin, um, again, now we're talking about how to get into this system. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that structure? No, this this is a solid structure. I mean, and so fifty thousand dollars. I mean, I said that forty thousand. What makes you competitive? So this would make you very competitive. We're not flying blind here. There are three big states that already run this system: Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut. Um, Maine and Connecticut have particularly generous um, forms of funding. And Maine and Connecticut, I mean, you have upwards in, in some elections of eighty percent of candidates opting in. So w we we know this works in other states. It's not perfect. Those those states have their own struggles with their system. But Hawaii isn't the first state to try this. We wouldn't be the first state to implement it. There is plenty of political science research that says this does a lot of good things. It probably increases the number of candidates. It probably increases candidate diversity. And it probably does not lead to more fringe candidates running. Um, that's a legitimate fear. But getting 125 people in your district to give you $5, that might sound easy. But, you know, walk around your neighborhood, say, I'm running for office, give me five bucks, you know. That's a hard thing to do. I mean, people forget very, very few people give any money to any right. candidates ever. I mean, federally, we're talking about one half of one percent of people give more than two hundred dollars every election cycle. So it's a tough, it's a relatively high bar. And okay, I so would almost push back and wonder if you ask that question um, to an extent. How much are you really looking at fridge candidacies? Because the current system we have now, all I need is a wealthy donor or a wealthy family, and I can have the most off-the-wall ideas, not referencing anybody that we know that held a seat or has held a seat. Name seats. names, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tip me, but, you know, this current system allows for fringe candidates to thrive. All you gotta do is be wealthy, and not for nothing, that systemically, like, to touch on something that Colin said, 
with the diversity of this program to do can this program can bring the way systemically that certain groups have had more access to money in this country and even in in this state things look away for a reason yeah, what a, Chad uh, the, the the term fringe candidate I think uh, you and I have had an awful lot of experience with fringe candidates. You know, when you work in news organizations and people call you and say, I want equal time mm -hmm. to the guy who's, who has actually got a chance of winning. Um, and, and again, just like it wouldn't eliminate PAC, super PACs, it wouldn't eliminate these fringe candidates because you could still run for office with very little, like 25 oh, signatures. In absolutely, state, right? I would say, there's even fringe incumbents right now in the state of Hawaii. I mean, it's, it, people oh. get to vote who they want to do. Okay. I think ultimately, though, many of them simply won't last. The voters will figure out at some point that they don't belong there, and they generally don't last very long. Um, but, you know, who, who is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. a fringe candidate? He collected enough signatures, his team, to get on the ballot here in Hawaii. Guess who's challenging it? The Democratic Party of Hawaii, who is worried that it's going to hurt Joe Biden come November. Oh, and Joe Biden could possibly lose Hawaii, really? I didn't yeah. say that at all. Okay, so <laughs> uh, a couple of questions, uh, several questions now coming in about the other end of it, the spending end of it, right? These are now taxpayer dollars that are going to these folks. Um, back to you, Kristen. How do you make sure that there's, they don't just, you know, go buy a Mercedes with it or go off and, you know, go traveling the world with that, that money. The two questions I, I want to read to give uh, respect to our viewers, what mechanism, me mechanisms, mechanisms would be necessary to ensure accountability and transparency in a system of public financing for election? That's from Brian Honolulu. Kevin Pearl City says, what are the concerns about the potential misuse of taxpayer dollars in public funding for elections? Can we guarantee that these dollars won't be misused? Great, 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 great questions. Well, on just like any candidate running in our state system, they have to file reports, and those reports will tell you how they're spending the money. And, the, and for a, a publicly funded candidate, I had referred to eight authorized uses. Their authorized use is very limited. They cannot be giving it and buying tickets to another candidate's uh, fundraiser. They cannot be using it to give to charitable organizations or, or public schools or public libraries. Um, this was very specific that has to be spent to um, to, to get their name, to get voted into office. Um, and as far as the uh, misuse of it, I mean, we're always looking for that. So uh, a lot of times we'll see that they use it for um, things like uh, a haircut or some coffee or to buy a shirt or, you know, something in that category that we, that's more of a personal use. And so we'll have to monitor it. Now, um, that is a reason why um, we believe, the commission believes, that a number of education, training, new forms, new, new um, um, guidebooks, things will have to be very specifically geared towards this new group of people, some of whom have never run before, and the electronic... And haven't had that much money before. And never had that much money before, absolutely. And, you know, they have to also understand that while they may qualify for this money, we will always reserve the right to go back and audit it. You know, so we have a very, 20 days is what we have to give them the money. You know, a couple of questions, um, and as someone who's covered your agency for many years, um, the reporting of the spending comes out in these reports that are, that are generated based on the calendar, right? So, so do you need to have more people in your agency to monitor this in real time or do you see actually having a real-time reporting system where when someone spends something, they, it immediately goes into a spreadsheet and is public? Um, the latter w is not how the system's been built right now, nor has the law been, um, requires that. It's basically reporting periods for a certain s period of time, and there's a deadline to file that report. If they and don't file that report... It comes in at the same time, and it's hard to... It's, it's a ton of stuff comes in at the same time. Absolutely. And sometimes these reports bunch up together because we, di we have a primary and we have a general, and those are very quick turnarounds. Um, but what is good about our system is it's because it's electronic, once it's filed, anybody could look at the data. 
and it can be searched very quickly. So that mechanism is there um, for to anybody. Add to that real quick. You know, the CSC is not out here by themselves. Like she said, that data becomes public immediately. Mm -hmm. So watchdog groups like myself at Common Cause and other groups will be there to support the CSC in this lift. Okay, so we've pretty much, I think we've pretty fairly described what this is about. Um, all four of you, uh, what's the other side of this argument? I mean, are there things that we're not mentioning here? Because this is basically a group of people that kind of support it. I don't know, Chad, you're maybe more middle of the road, but basically support this. So what's the other side of the story here? Incumbents don't want to lose. Um, I'll give Nadine. Well, we know that part. <laughs> I know, but at least Nadine Nakamura, the House Majority Leader, went on record saying she's a Democrat. This is a Democratic Party-controlled state. Admitted that they worry, she and others in her party, that more Republicans will get into office if this uh, comprehensive public financing system mm -hmm. takes place. I'm trying to be a dog whistle, honestly, <laughs> um, because you, you, you can't guarantee that it's going to be a Republican, so you're trying to scare me by party because you may get unseated in a primary. And democracy is competition. I agree, but remember, this is the same body that also doesn't want term limits. <laughs> uh, and But I think it does go to this fundamental fear that um, you're going to be challenged. And the reality is, and I don't know what the stats are, but isn't something like 90% of all incumbents right. basically get in year after year after year? And, and, and they like their jobs, and there's benefits to those jobs. I mean, some of these guys have so much money that they can give money to other campaigns. And do. Even though that's not what the donor planned when they gave him a check. Colin would like to weigh in. Okay, let me, let me give you the strong version of the argument against this. But being clear, I largely think this is, this is, this is Mine was good. a simple yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 you're, <laughs> I didn't mean that. So, so, so there are people who are skeptics, and I think the strong version is, A, this is a waste of money. It doesn't have a very much of an effect on the sort of public policies that are created. It doesn't really do much to make uh, you know, the, the donors and the candidates all that more diverse. And we, we already talked about how it might create more polarization that you get fringe candidates um, being elected. And it doesn't do that much to end corruption. Some of this is a little bit true, right? Not because this does any harm, but because we don't have any evidence, for example, that states that have implemented a public financing system show measurable decreases in corruption. That's partly because that's a hard thing to measure. I mean, one question might be, if we had public financing, would this have stopped something like uh, the Kalani English scandal? Mm, maybe not. Um, I think it might have might have stopped something well, like It's sort of yeah. ironic yeah. because we're so tough on their campaign money that they need to take their bribes, you know, in cash and envelopes <laughs> and cars. Or poker <laughs> chips. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, you know, I, there, there's very little evidence in any of the states that implemented this that this hasn't largely been a force for good. It, re, it certainly hasn't done anything bad, I think. So the, the only argument, the strongest version of this argument is that the money is just better spent elsewhere. There's a lot of money for an unproven, uh, well, I well, say not unproven, unproven but, 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 but you don't know for sure. About all of the effects, Like, you, sure. can, you know if you spend money on a rogue, you're gonna get a rogue. Yeah. Um, the, Alika on email asks, what are the proven benefits to clean elections? Are there any benefits that would specifically help women and girls? Yes, yeah. we've seen diversity in candidates shoot up. In, in every research shows that with access to public funds comes more diversity. And here in Hawaii, we have a great opportunity to not only get our, our young women population involved, but to really get Kanaka involved in a way, um, in, in, in a way that they're not represented at the legislature. Like, let's just call a spade a spade. They're not well represented. And they can't even represent in their communities because they're outspent by candidates. So we could see an increase in, in, in women um, in women legislators. We could see an increase in Kanaka legislatures. And what would that do for us? Like, can we only imagine what type of cultural shift that could bring? Well, I, I just to throw out my own opinion, uh, which is always dangerous. But, <laughs> but I mean, cause, uh, you know, in covering elections for many years, what you do see is that the incumbents have the money and they get it from because they're incumbents and they a lot of them don't buck the system and you don't get you don't get change mm -hmm. you know so just if you want to change something change something <laughs> don't keep going back to the same same wheelhouse and a lot of incumbents run unchallenged or unchallenged by people who have much money to run against them so even if they were to run 
you know, even if they were to raise their own money privately, which a lot of incumbents probably would, even if we got this system, they'd still have legitimate challengers. I mean, they'd have people who had a voice because they had $50,000 to send flyers. Um, so, you know, they'd have to run a real campaign. They wouldn't just be able to say, well, looks like I got reelected again you know, for another really two years. When you start talking about issues, right? So, like, let's talk about the, the council pay raise issue, right? The ones that are running for reelection within, you know, seven or eight months of taking that pay raise pretty much didn't take the pay raise. Mm -hmm. But the ones that are going to be not having to run again for three years tended to take the pay raise. What they needed would have to be a well-funded challenger to come to their voters and say, remember three mm -hmm. years ago he took this money? And other issues like that, you have to have good challengers to actually bring up the flaws in a candidate. And that's what money would do, right? Because if I'm a good challenger and now I have to recall because... We all have a microwave, microwavable memory now. It's very quick. But if I'm <laughs> going to put out campaign ads now, I'm going to remind you every day in this TV ad that these this council member took the money. So now that I have the money, I can remind you. However, if I'm just a good candidate and I don't have the money to help drive that messaging home, I'm I'm fighting on my own. So I have to announce a conflict of interest. I do work for a for-profit television station. Um, how much does a 60-second political ad cost on local TV? Anybody got that number? Well, you're a TV guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't take the money in person. I can tell you this. It's the biggest expense <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, for congressional campaigns, the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, senators, the, the people that run a statewide or at least half a state campaign. It is an enormous cost. And, of course, the local TV stations as well as radio stations. I work for a nonprofit, so I can say this. Uh, but it's, it's a huge amount of money. Now social media, even though it's still relatively inexpensive compared to TV, to broadcast, it, too, is coming uh, really more expensive because people realize it has such great reach. So what will the campaigns look like, do you think, Colin? Well, I hope that there's going to be a lot more speech. I mean, that's really the philosophy behind this. It's that we can't, we can't really regulate what the wealthiest candidates are spending, and they have a big voice. But we're going to give everybody a little bit of some resources so they can have a voice, too. And so my hope is, if this works, is that you would have... Uh, you know, more candidates running, more diverse perspectives, more flyers in your mailbox. It, it's not so much that, that money in politics is bad, right? I think it's good to spend money on getting people familiar with candidates, getting people familiar with well, issues. you have to access but, people. I mean, it costs yeah, money to access yeah, people. Right. them where they are, and that costs but money. But it's just unequal that not everyone has that opportunity. Okay, so now, moving along, I, I love the way this show is going. This is kind of fun. <laughs> so we got a bunch of questions here about other things that can be done, sure. right? So beyond public financing, what other reforms to our election system are needed? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, can we do this through a constitutional amendment and not in the legislature? That in and of itself is an issue. You, we don't uh, have direct citizens. We don't have citizens' initiative at the state level, so you would not be able to do that. It would have to, to go through the legislature or to have a con con and able to do that. I, I wondered why you put the other card aside. <laughs> there has been some progress. Uh, because, because it was the, the same guy that wrote the other question. <laughs> 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 there has been some change, uh, some of it more than incremental. Uh, there now is a law in place. It's only been a couple of years. Kristen, correct me if I have the date wrong, but uh, the, you cannot hold a fundraiser, an organized fundraiser, when the legislature is meeting in session, which means right now from January to May. If you're an elected official. If you're an elected official. You can, however, still accept contributions. You just cannot say, hey, yeah. come to my fundraiser, consider giving $500 or $2,000. So that's something that has changed. One example, whether it really will change things going forward, I think it's still too soon. Although we went back and looked at the numbers and people were still getting the money after all. And it can't be from a lobbyist. That's either. correct. <laughs> that's another change in the law. Well, I think the reason that this question came up was because, anonymous, uh, was that, um, you know, if we can't get the legislature to do it, what about a constitutional convention? And, you know... We haven't approved, the voters haven't approved a constitutional convention since... Well, it's, it's the, it, every 10 years it automatically comes up, or the legislature has someone propose it, and you're right, we haven't had one. But before 1978, which was a major change in, in Hawaii history, you had conventions on a fairly regular basis. You know, a w good question here from Michelle and Hilo. Do voters, Hawaii voters support clean elections? The only way to find out is if this became a constitutional amendment. Well, we've polled them. Um, the Clean Elections Coalition, which Common Cause is a part of with a lot of amazing groups such as Indivisible Hawaii as well as um, Legal Women Voters Hawaii. And we found that one, 
remarkably over 60 percent of voters feel that their elected politicians are more beholden to their um to their funders rather than the interests of the community and we found that over 70 percent polled want clean elections this isn't a, a a fringe want this is a a need for the community but but polling can be a little tricky on this issue at least the national polls so if you ask people are they in favor of a a clean election system, most folks say yes. People are very concerned, like Cameron says, with money and politics. But then when you phrase the question a little bit differently, and you say, would you, would you like your tax dollars to go to pay for this? The support is a little less. And so, I mean, we should acknowledge that, that voters are skeptical about using tax dollars that could go to other things to, to pay for this. And I mean, I think that, you know, that's, that's what, you know, folks like Cameron and his great work, I mean, they're trying to persuade people that this is money well spent. But there is some, some legitimate skepticism about that. And one thing well, I can say great about that polling, to Colin's point, is you do see a decrease when it's framed as um, your tax dollars going there. But with the Hawaii poll, we still saw 50%. Well, you know, right now is tax season, and right. I just did yes. my taxes, and I was asked, do I want to put $3 into the, uh, yes. into the public yes. funding? So how many taxpayers yes. actually uh, participate? It's kind of, okay, so if we want to really talk about public interest, you know, as I had mentioned, we did the partial public funding program since 1980, so that's 23 elections. And every, for the last 10 plus years, we've done a survey, and part of the survey which anybody who can can respond to for one month, we ask, do you support par partial public funding? Do you support the $3 tax checkoff? And inevitably, there is a good portion that says we do not like taxpayer money going to fund elections, particularly because I don't know if that candidate is in my district and supports my interests. Mm. So that is in and of itself a system because what people need to understand is the $3 tax checkoff is not money from your from from your your coffers from your personal it's three dollars from the general fund to go to the hawaii election campaign fund and every tax year we only average about receiving something like a hundred ten thousand dollars that's all we get now this is a 30 million dollar price tag i would hope that if you really support that you therefore say we want three dollars from the tax from the, from the general fund to go to this program. That, to me, shows true grassroots interest because it's something within the public's power to do now. But within context, though, and I get that point, but I would say within context, we have one of the worst voter turnout, participation in democracy in this nation. So to think that this nation, that this state would somehow be really open and receptive to giving money, especially when you look at the history of this state and its relationship with the government, it makes sense why people wouldn't, which is why I think we all talk about a cultural shift is needed with this. Well, you know, I, I bet Chad will like this question, that, but I mean, that's because our elections are so boring. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, mean, it, it, I, I mean, I'm a terrible one to say it. They I are this them, year, I mean, they're all, and maybe that'll change, but I don't, but the, the top but, races are not very competitive. Having said that, we have in fact had some very, very competitive races. But to the earlier point, incumbency is powerful, and those people get back more and more. I think the bigger problem is you have one party that mm. dominates this state. Mm. You have a minority party that really is ineffectual, and you have independent parties trying to make inroads, and it's just not happening. My, my, my question, uh, maybe, um, Colin, is if you had a lot more competitive races at the grassroots level, House and Senate, Council, you know, you could theoretically make things a little more interesting in the district. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's one thing we hope is that you'll have more candidates running. And so you will get more interest from from constituents, from citizens. And there is some evidence of this. In Arizona, they saw that the people who were voting on down ticket races, the less interesting low level legislative races, that increased after they created this public financing system because there's just a lot more speech. Um, you know, there's a lot more competitive races at that lowest level. Um, and so when you get that level of competition, people people pay attention, it makes sense, right? And so I think that's one thing um, that we hope will happen. The other thing that I think that we haven't mentioned that um, we hope will happen is, is that candidates, and, and this is true from the candidates in Maine and Arizona who have responded to surveys about this, some candidates like this too. It's not all incumbents who are opposed to this because candidates don't all love to raise money, right? It takes a lot of time. And so some candidates- It takes the most time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and it's not it's always pleasant. It's the biggest pleasant. part of their job. Yeah, exactly. 
And so one thing we find from some studies in Maine is that candidates spend a lot more time at community forums talking to voters mm -hmm. about issues because they don't have to go out and raise money all the time. Well, let me ask, though, these, these, these things you're citing, mm -hmm. these are actual these quantitative are, these information. Are quantitative political science studies. There's been that a the lot of research has access on this. To, yeah, no, I mean, it, there's a... You hear a report, which I wrote, uh, which everyone is welcome to read. <laughs> but but th this is this isn't my research. This is based on the, the, you know the best research we have on years of quantitative studies of these systems in different states. And even think about that, right? Like of uh, spending more time with your constituents. A house term is only two years. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to maybe get acclimated my first year, participate, and then the second year I have no real incentive to pass any reform bill, and I'm. You know, thank God for the new um, law that says you have to wait to fundraise, to hold a fundraiser, but we know there are ways that people get around that. So you're already in your second year, only one year into your job, and you're already thinking and planning and plotting on your next term. So you're taking that year away from the voters, and now you're dedicating to yourself to fundraise. We're not getting the most out of our legislatures that we could be. Do we have any numbers of, of how many people would participate in something like this? I don't think that's a quantitative thing, like how many people would participate. Well, is, is, there, is there any evidence out there that half of them would do it? Because if half of them did it and they all said, I'm not taking money from anybody else, that's a pretty big change. Mm -hmm. And we have seen those changes in some of the states that have adopted this. Better, um, yeah. You know, the, 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 the level of participation in Maine, Connecticut is pretty high. What, 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 what is important is, is that the money has to be enough. In other words, we have to offer enough public financing where it makes more sense to opt into public financing than to try to raise private Because they're money. saying no to all this money that they could get. Right. And if, you, if it's $50,000 and that's about what you would raise if you were raising yourself, then it makes sense to opt in. If it's only $10,000, I mean, this is the reason our current system doesn't work because it's just not enough money. Yeah. Um, and then you can't raise privately ab above and beyond that, so you're not competitive. And and we should make clear the bill that died, the comprehensive bill, Carl Rhodes' bill, did not have the $30 million no. in the legislation nor the $200,000 mm -hmm. needed for your staff right. to be able to go and fund this right. thing to, to do that research and make people, mm -hmm. sure people are not sure. you know, f uh, f filing fraudulent reports. But $30 million, as one senator said, is a drop in the bucket in a $1.9 billion state budget. It's literally less than 1%. And when we think I'll about the it. fact that CSC has not had any added um, positions since statehood. The Campaign Spending si Commission. Yes, campaign, I'm sorry, Campaign Spending Commission has not had any added positions since statehood. That is absolutely abhorrent. Let me go back to something. I'm, I'm going to bring this up over objections, I think. But, you know, uh, the Kaneshiro trial right now, right, he basically got money from a, a, a prominent developer and is accused of directing a prosecution at one of, the, one of the former employees because he got this money. There's an awful lot of people who get money. Do we believe that the money that a person gives is likely to get that much influence over someone? You know, it's interesting. Yes. Before Dennis Mitsunaga really, uh, I mean, he's well known. Dennis, Dennis he Mitsunaga. raised money for everybody. For someone who goes over campaign finance records again and again and again, it's amazing how many times, and he's not the only one, mm -hmm. but Dennis Mitsunaga and a vice president and another Mitsunaga, and it was like, why are you having everybody in your company give money to all these candidates? Well, clearly you want to influence the outcome. I'm not making a judgment of what's going to happen in the Keith Conoshiro case, and I believe the total amount of money wasn't even all that much, right? About 50 Less grand? 50 is that what grand, it is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but um, it, it does go to this point. Why do you give so much money mm -hmm. and have your, I mean, people do it. People who work for a mayor or a governor will give to their own Let me boss. Ask Kristen, <laughs> is it being tau? I mean, do you guys make an assumption at campaign spending that if someone gets a lot of money from one person, that there's likely, um, you know, uh, decisions being made on behalf of that person? Oh, no. I mean, but we do look at the reports and we do see if it's a series of contribution uh, from the same employer in a in the same reporting cycle in the same with a lot of times the same dates it does raise an raise a, an eyebrow to us um, but I, I I will say this you know proving that yes yeah. is quite another issue <coughs> um, so we have to be very real with our resources and what we can prove. You know, let me ask this question. It's an interesting question for Bandy and Lulu. And I thought I first I thought, eh, this is kind of a hard question to answer, but now that we've talked about a quid pro accusation, 
called an accusation, what are the potential economic implications of implementing public financing for elections and how might it affect taxpayers? Is there any potential that this is going to save money if you invest in free and fair elections competition? For example, Mitsunaga was a government contractor. Many government contractors are among the biggest givers yep. historically, and there's a lot of non-bid contracts out there that they get. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, if you took away their influence, would there be more fairness in the contract? Well, system? remember, you're not taking away their influence. Uh, people can still take money. They can from, still give. Yeah, and so that that's. But if, if half the if the half the politicians aren't taking that money anymore, does it change that dynamic? So I'm just throwing this out of the question. I, I don't know. But yeah. I mean, would, would, would it be less likely that these big contractors are going to get the be first in line for the non-bid contract? I would say more than it is now, and I would say that confidently, in that right now the system is set up again to where if you are a big contractor and you're trying to get this bid, I have every reason to get it to you because of all the influence that I may be able to get. However, if I'm coming up on this on this um, public system of campaign financing, then I'm beholden literally to the people that I am voting with. Therefore, I'm looking at more local businesses because they're the ones who are keeping me in my seat. I'm not looking for super PACs that have representation here with funding on the continent. No, I'm looking more inward. So I wouldn't wouldn't jump and say, oh, you're going to see like a 60% rise. But do I think you will see better um, decision making as far as for the local economy and towards local businesses? I definitely think you have the potential for that. Anybody else agree? I'm, I'm less optimistic, although I would like to be able to share your enthusiasm for that. I tell you what Civil Beat has done sometimes. You're trying to prove that quid pro quo. It's very difficult to do. But we've done stories on a bill that mysteriously died at a certain date, and whoa, the very next day there was a fundraiser in which so-and-so who worked for that company that could benefit from that bill or, or not benefit from the bill gave them a big check, and that happens over and over and over again. But how do you, how do you prove that and say, oh, I took the check because I, you know, I killed the bill because I wanted their money? That's very difficult to prove. And what I don't do think, think, though, it's so much that we have to prove it to Chad's point, I think it's something, or in like a legal sense, yeah. I think with this system of um, campaign, public campaign financing, we would have to prove it more in the court of opinion. We would have to, a public opinion, we'd have to make the people see like, hey, they're still taking these dollars or they're taking these dollars and this is what's coming from it. To Chad's point of you can have somebody kill a bill and then they're fundraising the next day or you can have somebody kill a bill only to find out that their husband was the CEO of a company that really wanted this bill gone. Making this news and what Civil Beat does and what PBS does by bringing this news, now the voters, the everyday voter, has a way to fight back, not just with their vote, but also with their coin. You know, let me, let me, we only got about three minutes left. Time goes fast. I already <laughs> said already? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you know, the biggest issue, one of the hugest issues, and we saw this on Maui, was that there's this underlying distrust of government in this state, um, underlying cynicism. We talk about l low voting r rates. What do you, and I'd like all of you to pitch in fairly quickly, do you think that this would improve the public's trust in government, which would be a huge accomplishment? Colin? I do. I mean, I think that if you saw something like 80% of candidates now taking money from the public system, um, you saw incumbents losing regularly. I mean, that gives people a sense that elections are fair. Um, I mean, we have an incredibly low trust in government in this state, so I think this will help. It's not a silver bullet, but I do think it would move the needle, yeah. Cameron? I know that you think so, but uh, tell, tell us why we should think so. No, I absolutely think so. I think ultimately, um, I'm so sorry, I lost the question. Repeat it one more time. Do you think the system will lift trust in Oh, absolutely, government? yes. I think, again, what it do is it'll allow to a diversity, allow to communities being represented by people who they feel like are them or along with them. It gives me a reason, too. If I know $5, one, my tax dollars, okay? So if I'm driving on this road and I fill it up, I'm like, why are my tax dollars paying for a bumpy road? But if I know $5 of my tax dollars or $5 are going to a candidate, oh, I'm participating in that election because my money's in it. My, I have stake in it. The same way that Bill Gates may have stake in an election that he's funding with his $30 million because he can because that's proportional to the $5 that I can give with my salary. Now I'm going to buy in more. So I think adding that money element and letting voters know, like, hey, you're financially, you have stake in this. Tristan? Um, I, I would agree. I think we have to start somewhere, and if this is a good thing, I think it has to be embraced philosophically. Um, uh, but it's a it's a start. I don't think that in if it if it were to be approved in its first year of implementation, 
Um, I'd be surprised, but I would be happily surprised. But I think it's a good start in the right conversation to earn back the trust. It's a part of the strategy. How big, Chad, do you think this would be in that process of, of lifting trust? Lack of trust in our government can't get any lower right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say that across the board for institutions. Why not give it a try? It is, however, ultimately up to the voters uh -huh. to decide who they want to be in office and how they want to fund them, basically. So I wonder if there might have been an argument to the legislature this year. It's like, don't, don't just pass this system and devote $30 million to it this year, but put it in a constitutional amendment and let the voters decide. I mean, yeah. would that I have been another approach? I don't know if it's a constitutional question or a statutory question, to be honest with you, but it certainly would measure... There's a lot of statutory stuff in our constitution. That's true. That's a very good point. Uh, I would love to see it go up for a vote and see what people say, other than just a poll, right? Right, and I would love to see these, <laughs> these legislators who do, many of them say, it's a good program in theory, and they will say, you know, maybe this part of the bill or we took this out or, you know, you need this for um, campaign spending commission, whatever, what have you. I would love to see them invite people like us who are all passionate about this to the table to see how we can make this work using their minds and ours because if they're bought into it like we are then we can really do something for our great state besides paying lip service okay very good thank you so much and mahalo to all of you folks at home for joining us tonight and we thank our guests kristen izumo <laughs> nitao izumi nitao from the state campaign spending commission thank you. cameron hurt from common cause hawaii chad blair from honolulu civil beat and political analyst colin moore Next week, should the state legislature be full-time? Right now, lawmakers are limited to a 60-day session, which limits their influence most of the year and forces many critical decisions to be made under deadline pressure. But will more time make things better or worse? Please join us then. I'm Darrell Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. broadcasts of insight